Let's get this show on the road. I'm start my thing. So, thank you for coming. My name is Dan. Uh, I am the artist who worked on Radio Stampede with Dylan and Tim at Featherweight. And today, I'm going to be talking about some well, equal parts philosophy, a little bit of design, and then art pipeline stuff. But it's going to be a pretty personal talk. And uh, I kind of apologize. I've been working 16 hour days and some weekends for like 18 months and looking forward to a holiday. So I might be a little bit sketchy, but I've been practicing and trying to make sure I give you a good experience. Feel free to ask questions. Um, so breaking rules and making tofu about relationships with your giants. And I'd just like to de dedicate this talk to my girls. It's my wife, Christine, my daughter, Kaya. She's 18 months old. And this game would never have happened without them. And that's actually quite literal due to some pivotal moments. So thank you to them. So um, I made everything that you see there with your eyeballs, and that was my function on this project. And Radio Stampede was made by, well, primarily three people. Um, uh, Dylan in the middle there, and his best friend since high school, Tim, and myself. I met Dylan when he was working at Half Brick, and mm -hmm. uh, when the chance to go indie came up, I jumped on it. And so, yeah, it was a partnership between them two and me. And we had a bit of help. We had some help from uh, Paul Kopetko, who is an absolutely amazing virtuoso sound designer and composer. And we had some help from Yodo for Android support and uh, China market release and localization. So when I talk about giants, I'm probably going to talk about them a little bit differently to how some other people might talk about them. But this story starts with me going for Lindy, which was the biggest decision I've ever made in my life and a source of much uh, heartache and, and like now just like celebration. So 90 days out from going full indie, I became a dad for the first time. I uh, had some experience raising kids because I raised my niece and nephew, but it was a big thing. And 28 days out from going indie, I quit my full-time job, which was in the games industry. Uh, and it was full-time and it was security. And day zero, I teamed up with Featherweight, and then something, 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 and then 365 days to the day later, we didn't exactly plan it that way, it just kind of happened, uh, Radio Stampede version 1.0 was released, and holy cow, we got 10 million downloads in our first month, which was uh, just like beyond our wildest dreams and kind of crazy, and there's, yeah, there's luck involved, and Pokemon Go came out two weeks later, and had we released two weeks later, you know, who knows what it would have happened, we mightn't have got nothing, so it's you know, a bit of alchemy and magic and crazy luck. And, but something went well during that 365 days. And when I talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, I'm, I don't know, if, has everyone quoted this in their talks? This is like where the quote comes from, or at least it's been traced back to someone who says that we can see more clearly and further than they can. And not because of our own vision or stature, but because we are supported and elevated by those who came before us. And so when I talk about giants, I talk about really everyone has their own personal giants and you need to get to know them because the giants are kind of your rules, the things that you live by, the big parts of your life. And to illustrate, I mean, this is a pretty personal reference, but this sums it up for me. So I'll try and turn this up, make sure that it's loud. So, Gilly, big baseball fan? Kind of. Yeah, Dad bring you here a lot? Once a year on my birthday, then he pays an usher to watch me. Oh. I see. But you have to understand, my father, in his own childhood, was without a positive male influence. Huh? His own father kicked him out when he was 15. So my dad was taught to see child raising as a job, a burden, a prison, rather than a playground. You understand what I'm saying? 
You don't talk like a kid. Yeah, well, I'm not really a kid. You're not a duck. This is a memory of when I was a kid. I'm 35 now. I have kids of my own. You don't really even exist. You're an amalgam. A what? A combination of several ushers my dad left me with over the years. I've combined them into one memory. Why? This was a great symbolic moment in my life. My father dumping me with you. It's why I swore things would be different with my kids. That's my dream. Strong, happy, confident kids. That's great. That's great. You know, you, you got a lovely family, and uh, I'm a goddamn amalgam. Gil? Who's that? That's my wife. Nice. Gil? Yeah? The game's over, honey. St. Louis Card, which to thank you for attending So that's Parenthood, 1989, Steve Martin, good movie. Um, and I saw it as a kid and didn't really get it, but it made an impression as I, you know, I think I came across it years later and it really stuck. Um, so giants to me are not necessarily one person. They're kind of amalgamations of experience and people you meet and, and learnings that you have. And giants allow you to see further and more clearly than if you hadn't had them, right? Like if you hadn't been through these things, met these people, done these things, you wouldn't see as far as you do. And provided that you relate well to these giants and you obey their demands, they will carry you through the hardest parts of your life and they will carry you to success. But if you don't have a good relationship with your own giants, your mental projections of what's valuable in life, you will... You'll have stress, you'll have anxiety, you'll have guilt, and you'll feel like you're on the wrong path. So you have to you know, have a good relationship with your giants, and sometimes it's a matter of balancing the priorities of two or more giants in your life. You might have giants of your personal relationships, giants of your work relationships, giants of your aspirations and dreams for yourself in life, and they will not always get on, and sometimes you've got you know, giant versus giant going on, and it's hard to keep the peace and to find the right path. So be good with your giants. Get to know them. And sometimes the best way to do that is to grapple with your giants. This brings me to the first part of the talk, which is about bending your own rules. Sometimes you've got to do it. So without going into too much detail, childhood was a hard thing. It just, like, it wasn't good. And uh, really it was about a disparity between, uh, like, there was conflict in my family about love and money. And this is a thing that stuck with me, and it kind of made me a sensitive, emotional person who's pretty creative. But I wasn't a deprived child. Like, I, I was put in a room with things like these. And these became my dreamings, my adventures, my bedtime stories. Like, these things that you see here, like, the fondest memories I have as a kid of learning and, like, aspiration. And eventually I came across one which wasn't just a passive experience that you played, right? You made it. You painted sprites in 16 glorious colours and you animated the, the characters in the game and you came up with a story, you came up with, with levels and you built stuff. And it was like breathing for me. I'd been holding my breath while inhaling all of these amazing experiences. I'd never, never exhaled, never tried to make one myself. And that was a pivotal moment and it lasted all the way through my schooling. Now, I remember what I was doing at school and I did okay. I was doing things like this. I was building mods for, for, for Doom and making maps and like trying to make tournament levels for my friends to play at the, the internet cafe. And I was making command and conquer scenarios, rebalancing units, making maps. And so when I, when I came to the end of high school, I went into all of these wonderful things that didn't exist in 1997. And no, you can't, you can't go do what you want because that's not a real job. You have to go get a real job because it's 1997 and these things are not around. So instead, I met someone cool called Gavin Sade, and he told me about a course that he was helping run at QUT. And he introduced me to Deb Paulson and Chris Barker and Jane Turner, all awesome people who taught me a lot. And it was called communication design, but what the hell does that mean? Because it involves things from art history, world music, cognitive psychology, HTML, web design, sound design, digital video production, macromedia director. That's a useful program. <laughs> Interactive writing, 
hand-drawn animation, Flash, Lightwave 3D, Alias Wavefront Maya, yeah, it was once run by a company called Alias Wavefront, and Teamwork and Brute Project. So man, like I learn so much, but when it comes to applying for jobs and people ask what do you specialize in, and I say nothing or everything, give me a job please. They say, sorry, we're looking for someone with a specific event in one area and I'm a jack of all trades. So what do you do? Well, you try and get a real job. And I'm like, surely there is a way to do what I love, right? There's all these people who are in before me on a global stage and I've been playing a game since I was a little kid. There's Jeff Minter with his crazy animal games, Eric Chahi who single-handedly animated Another World, which was this cool action game set in cinematic world. Uh, Tim Kaine in Fallout, which was like Mad Max made mostly by one person, incredible. And Michelle Ansel, who challenged the notions of like modern media and like, you know, the unreliable narrator in action stories and, you know, world politics and super, super underrated game. Uh, and Fumito Ueda with Shadow of the Colossus, where he fused cinema and games and Miyazaki, who was awesome, even though he didn't make games. So I went, to, I met some cool people through networking and trying to do stuff and I met uh, the guys from the AFTRS and they, they invited me to be one of four students selected each year, which is a huge thing, right? Only four people get in each year. Well, this was how it used to be, right? To do digital media projects at the AFTRS. AFTRS stands for Australian Film, Television, Radio School. Film, Television and Radio. No G in there. But they taught us about drama. They taught us about what is at the core of every entertaining human experience and what makes them nourishing and not just like candy that you chomp on and forget, but really meaningful stories. And they taught us about digital video production, like, like high quality animation for the film industry. So it was a really professional, rigorous thing. But it wasn't games. So in my spare time, in my evenings, I was still making games and still making mods. And I met some really cool people who were making a Source Engine 2 mod called Dystopia. And we won. IGF 2007, best mod of the year. And we were like, oh man, this is the best. It's so cool. One of our team members got up on stage. The team was invited to Valve offices. A couple of guys met Gabe Newell, had a chat with him. But it wasn't real business. No one was getting paid. It was an ad hocracy. And eventually everyone got different job offers. We all went our separate ways and nothing happened. And it like turned into a cool thing that we did that didn't go anywhere. So I was at Aftus, desperately trying to squeeze a G in there. <laughs> Like, and preaching sometimes to the converted, sometimes to the deaf ears. But, you know, film industry is pretty strong in New South Wales and it doesn't make a lot of room for games. So, yeah. What do you do? Well, sometimes you get a break. But before I talk about that, all of this life experience, constantly trying to find an in, always wanting to do the thing I love, which is make games, but, like, not starve. Um, you know, I'm working at a chicken shop while I go through film school trying to make a, a, a way forward. It all kind of builds up and it amalgamates. So this is what I was talking about earlier about all your life experience just kind of manifests and transforms into the giant of indie, which is a big part of my life. It's a primal motivating force is to be independent because it's clear by this stage in my life no one's going to pay me to make games. No one's going to give me that job or so, so I thought. And so the giant of indie offers great things but also makes demands. It offers creative freedom, but it demands that you be a daring pioneer. You can't kind of sit there humbly and wait for it to happen. You have to do it yourself. You can reap the rewards of your own work, but you have to take big financial risks to do so. And there's no guarantee of success. And you can be your own person, right? You can work however you want in whatever kind of informal way, you know, sit in your underwear till 2 a.m. and make things. But you've got to do it all yourself because no one's going to work with you if you work that way. So DIY all the things. So there's, there's pros and cons to the giant of indie. But as I was filled with this, this desire to go out and do my own thing, I remembered my childhood. And I remembered that insecurity in either emotional or financial terms is really bad and disastrous. And so that was a risk I couldn't really take because I could never forget my childhood, which also manifested into this giant of family. Now, family means different things to different people, but to me, it meant that you could build a solid future and have stability, but you have to stay tied down. You can't just run off and follow your own dreams necessarily, because family comes first. You get a sense of belonging and support, which for me as a sensitive, emotional person was really important. But you have to take absolute responsibility. You have to put family first. You can't put anything in front of it. And it gives you hell of motivation. If you've got people relying on you, 
then you motivate it. It's a great way to make you get up in the morning, make you focus on what's important. But it's incredibly draining. And this is a lot what it's like to have a family and raise a child. So Indy versus family. When the Indy and the family come together, they don't work. Because you can't be a daring pioneer if you're tied down. You can't take financial risks if you're taking absolute responsibility for your family. And you can't do all the things if you're already drained from putting other things first. So that was heartbreaking. And I had to go and get a real job. So I did. Because these people introduced me to one Mr. George Miller, who makes amazing things on a large scale. He's a great storyteller, and he was very interested in games, which is why he wanted to meet me, and he ended up shaking my hand and offering me a job, and so I entered the film industry. And it's really all because of this crazy random stuff that I studied back when I thought it wasn't relevant. All the things that didn't relate to games, like this gentleman in the bottom left, Carl Jung, a psychologist of the archetypes in the collective unconscious, and the guy just to the right of him, Joseph Campbell, the story theorist of the monomyth and the hero's journey, who you've probably heard of. And so I got to work on things like Happy Feet 2 and Mad Max 4, which were like, don't get me wrong, games are awesome and I want to work on them, but if I had to work on something that's not games, these are pretty amazing. Large-scale creative productions, I got to be in the director's unit, working with the story department, doing 3D previews, and that was great. So all of this stuff, this professional career where it's like super high stakes, really long hours, meeting really famous people, doing really high-quality work, this amalgamated as well into the giant of job who offers capability, right, real capability to do amazing things if you have the humility to learn. It offers the esteem, right, you get street cred and you get high esteem with the people you work with if you act with conscience and you're conscientious in what you do. And it offers financial security, which when you, you know, care about your family a lot, that's a thing. But you have to remain subordinate. And if the person steering the ship goes the wrong way, you're in it for the long run and maybe going down with it, which on Happy Fit 2 was certainly the case. Um, but Giant of job can support the giant of family. You can build a future and have all of these things. And it's good, and this works for a lot of people. And it did for me for a while. But it's not making games. <laughs> so if I couldn't find a community of people to make games with, I was going to start one myself. So I, uh, Truna, Jane Turner from Brisbane IGDA, she was a mentor of mine from QUT, and she told me, just go do it. Just go start IGDA Sydney, bring people together. And I did. And you started with five people around a pub table, and now, like, I've passed the torch, and IGDA Sydney runs game jams every year. It has uh, huge events where lots of people come along every month, 200 plus, to show off their games and talk. And it's mostly students now, and I kind of, you know, I, I pop in occasionally. But what this did, right, was it put me on people's radar. And so I got to meet some of the cool people locally who were in the industry before me. Everyone on this page predates me in the games industry but I got to know them all. And people on the left were mentors, and people on the right offered me a job, and I got to meet them all, and they're really awesome. And for a time, I was able to have the giant of job with making games, which was good, but it didn't last. Not all things last. And so I found myself at a crossroads again, looking at indie versus job. And you can't be a daring pioneer when you're busy being humble and you know, not rocking the boat. And you can't take financial risks when you're being conscientious. And you can't do all the things yourself when you're busy following someone else's orders. So it's not going to happen. What do you do? And then something very special happened. So my wife was pregnant at this moment. And I didn't quit my job. But she said to me, if you don't try to go indie, you will end up a grumpy old man. And she knew me best. And she said she wanted a happy husband, even if it meant that we take risks. And so we could take a calculated risk. Surely we could figure this out. We could work out a, like, you know, a way to go indie which wasn't jeopardizing everything and make it happen. And so what she really did was she helped me sort out my rules, bending them so that it was possible. Because I thought it was an impasse. I thought it wasn't possible. And she said, look, we can try. So what she did is she made it possible to do all these things at once for a short time to see how it goes, which is awesome, because it means it can slay that giant. And I quit my job, and it felt really good. <laughs> Finally, I was going to go indie. And it just so happened that the timing was perfect, and Dylan and I wanted to work again, because we met at Halfbrick. And so he had his company with Tim, and he said, come partner with us, we'll make a game. I said, cool, I can afford a short amount of time to go indie, 
because I've got a baby on the way. But no, YOLO, let's do this. So we, we got really, really careful about it all. We thought, okay, we're taking a bit of a risk and we, you know, we don't want to waste our time together. So we're going to not put all our eggs in one basket. We're going to time box it. We're going to do, I can do between nine and 12 months of indie work, depending on how much contract work I pull in on the side. We're going to have a lot of planning and discussion before we make games. We're going to have a round robin pitch session where we put together all our ideas and we're going to list the top three democratically and like whittle them down. And then, you know, we're going to prototype several of those ideas. No all eggs in one basket. Right? We're going to try out a couple of ideas just to make sure that we're not like focusing in on the wrong thing. And we didn't do any of that. <laughs> oh my God, because sometimes things just happen and you go with it. Because the pitch that Dylan had for this game was really amazing. It was simple and it just gave rise to so many cool ideas we, we got caught up in them. So Dylan's pitch was pretty simple. He's like, you've heard of the running of the bulls in Spain where the, the bulls run through the streets and the people run with them. He's like, if a Texas rodeo champion turned up there, he'd say, y'all are doing it wrong. You're not meant to run beside them and get run over. You're meant to ride them like a champ. And this just went, wow, our brains exploded with cool ideas. We're like, it's like an action movie, like Indiana Jones. But where else have we seen a stampede? It's like in The Lion King. Yeah, and The Lion King's awesome because it's got all the African animals. What if you could ride an elephant? Oh, my God. And then what if you were capturing them all and, like, collecting them, like in Pokemon? And this... Explo this, this was, there was no going back. We were so excited and passionate about what we were doing that we kept going. And I found this old movie poster, which is from a movie made a long time ago, uh, and it kind of just fit. It's Africa, Texas style, back when Hollywood was less culturally sensitive. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so we had a core loop for this game. We you know, rough around the edges, both the usability and the art were in primordial, but we took it out and we gave it to strangers on the street. And it had issues, but it had legs, so we kept at it. And we never looked back. We never stopped working on our first idea. We never time boxed it again. We never like went, went back and said, oh, maybe we're doing the wrong thing. No, we just kind of, no time for that. More time for discussing what we should do next and planning our next move to carry this forward. And that's all we did. So it was validated. And so we got into questions like, okay, so we got a, we got a cool gimmick. How do we keep people coming back? Because we can't sell this game. Like, you have to do free-to-play, right? And we have to do mobile, because that's the only inroad that we can get with three people in, in such a short time frame. Anything else is out of our range. So what's going to keep people coming back, and how will they perceive value with rewarded ads and IAP? So we've got a cool idea, but what's going to make it feasible financially? So really, the question we're asking is how to approach free-to-play. Now, free-to-play, you've got to be polite. You've got to be super polite, because... There's so many games out there, people will drop you in a heartbeat for something that's more respectful of them and their time. So you have to have proper attire, right? You have to be all neat and tidy and you need to have free-to-play interactions that resonate with a core theme in the game. Not just like, you know, here's the game and then here's this disparate GUI that says, watch an ad, and they're not linked. If you thematically link them, you kind of build a sense of why it's worth doing. So if the player in this game is running a business, that's a bit of empathy, right? We're game devs. We're also running a business. Maybe if you can tie together the notion that uh, watching a video ad is the power of marketing, then you know that's something game devs need too. And hey, you're running a zoo. You need customers. A uh, mm. bit of empathy there for the devs? Yeah, cool. So you ask nicely. But you only ask once you've built a persistent sense of value in the user. right? You really need for the user to understand why it's a good idea for them to push that button. You're not begging and you're not like ramming it down their throat. You're presenting them with a good value proposition. And you have to respect the player, right? So no, no paywalls, none of this, hey, you've played a bit, now you've got to stop or give us money. And none of this, you've had two games now, we're going to force an ad in your face. None of this because people will quit your game and go to something better. Like, there's just too many options. So you've always got to have positive interactions. Never give the player uh, an interaction they don't want. They have to be in, in control. And what this means is, uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do you do this? How do you, like, we're eff effectively, at this point, giving away everything in the game for free with no guarantee of return. So we tweak. So, we, you know, we soft launch the game or we plan to, we haven't yet, but we plan to soft launch the game and look at the metrics carefully and just keep tweaking until people are having a positive enough experience that the incentivized ads are working. So they perceive value. And then at that point, pull out all the stops, focus on nothing else than a retention. 
Because if people are happy to watch the ads, all that matters now is keeping them interested. If they're, you know, this is like Crossy Road really did this well, and like it was a, one of the giants upon whose shoulders we stand is the Crossy Road model. But we also don't like to copy things exactly. We like to make things our own as well, which is why running a zoo was building a persistent sense of value and running a business. And it seems to have worked well. We've got pretty high retention. In fact, last time Dylan mentioned it, he said that we had like 70% 70, 70 average day one retention, which like back in the days of working at Huffbrick was like that was unheard of. That was pretty amazing. So lucky us and, you know, good on Dylan and Tim for being such great designers. Uh, so, yeah, we just have to reward people. We have to make it worth their while to come back. There's lots of remarkable discoveries. If every time you come back to a game you're going to chance upon something awesome, then you'll keep coming back, which just means we need lots and lots of content. That's no problem at all, right? We'll just go to the art department. <laughs> Hey, Dan, how you doing? Did you fall asleep there? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a daughter who's teething and keeping you awake all night and you're not getting any sleep? And now you have to be an entire one-person art department and make so much more content than you ever thought you were in for. But this was the right decision, right? The game had legs, and everyone that we got to play it with the small amount of content we had, the only complaint was, I want more. And that's a good problem to have. It just means that I now need to figure out how the hell to do this without killing myself and raising a baby at the same time. So I thought, what would MacGyver do? <laughs> How does he take available resources and turn them into a solution that's like out of this world? And what resulted was a bit more like this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I am still amazed that what I did didn't break and actually worked. So what I did was I had a voxel envy. I was looking at what things, like what's popular, what's easy to make, and uh, like what's cool and like what would suit our game. And really I looked at two different art styles. I looked at Crossy Road and I looked at Goddess. And Goddess has subtly like warped polys and Crossy has really bold, bold grid-like voxels. And I'm like, animals in our game have to be really fluid and they have to run and bounce and bend like, you know, in a stampede. It's not going to look great if they're all doing poppy voxel animation. So I came up with this idea, what if I could build a hybrid system that's like all the best things about voxels because they're building blocks and all the best things about polys because they're bendy and flexy. So this is literally what I did. Maya is my thing that I learned in the film industry. I'm pretty good at it. And so I just threw everything that I'd learned away. <laughs> all of the rules of thumb that you were taught in the film industry and, and before about the order of operations where you model, then you do UV layout, and then you do rigging and skinning, and then you do animation after that, and you can never go back because it's pro error prone and all kinds of... No, I, I, well, I guess I broke my own rules something big, and I just definitely f felt the giants of my, my teachers who, who taught me everything about 3D over my shoulder going, what the fuck are you doing? No, this is bad. But I did it anyway because YOLO, right? So what I did was I created a building block that's like voxels but bendy for fluid animation. And then I used those bendy building blocks like voxels to build pre-rigged characters. So because the rig's already made and the mesh is already skin weighted, you don't have to redo that. You just kind of slap them together like literally like squidgy blocks of tofu. And you can duplicate existing characters once they're already animated and squash and stretch them into other characters and you get 90% of your work for free. And then this wonderful function in Maya, which I've used a lot and it's quite delicate, but it's miraculous, is you can edit stuff after you've done everything and then delete non-deformer history. And if you figured out how to do it well, or if you're lucky, one of the two, it doesn't explode when you hit this button. <laughs> so I got really good at learning what makes it not explode. And it's, all, it's actually all user error. I was blaming Maya a lot, but you know. My fault. So I'm going to show you a little bit about this. Because what I did was after that four-week period, before we got to you know, the metagame discussion and like, you know, how we actually gonna how much content are we gonna have, I forged in secret a master tofu block. <laughs> which was about a week of work, which on our project was a long time. Like most things we build, we build in a day. And if it takes too long to build, then we don't do it. But I, I invested a bit of time to do this and the initial test, ta-da! It's pretty ugly, but it validated the idea of making tofu blocks into characters and propagating them. So I'm going to show you a little bit about this in Maya now, if you're interested. 
I'm trying to make sure Maya appears. Come on. There we go. OK. So this is Tofu. What? Uh, OK, I have to close the presentation and find my way back to it. This is going to be annoying. Sorry, everyone. I will have, literally have to reopen the presentation and get back to it, but it looks like it's not. OK, cool. Sorry about that, everyone. I'll try and make this as quick and painless as possible before we get back into it. So I'm, I'm doing OK. So this is Tofu. It is a rectangular prism, pre-rigged. And this is a leg, an arm, a neck, a body, a tail, a trunk of an elephant. And this one thing is used so many times throughout the game that any time that you're playing the game, you're probably seeing about 50 of them with like textures applied and, and doing their own thing. But it's, it's pretty good for making squashy, stretchy shapes. And it's kind of got all of its bendiness built in. And it has IK built in, so you can make things run. So what I did with that is I built animals out of it, kind of like you would if you were taking plasticine and switching it together. So if I go to the buffalo, it's the signature animal of our game. Just have to fix its texture. Yep, like I say, it's error prone. <laughs> but um, come on. All right, let's fix this texture. Sorry for the delay. Reload. Boink. There we go. So here we have the first character and probably the most iconic of the game. Now, more time was spent on this buffalo than most of the other animals combined. But he was the test bed. His design, as you saw from that earlier video, got refined a lot. But he runs, he bounces, he crashes, he nibbles on grass, he gets happy when you pet him. And yeah. So. By the time that this was happening, I was like, oh my gosh, I might actually be able to make lots of animals for the game. And this might be possible. Because the next thing I did was I took this exact character with all the animations currently applied to it. And I thought, well, the lucky thing is that other animals in Africa are also quadrupeds. And they also gallop. So the difference between a buffalo and a zebra is maybe the width of its body, the length of its legs. And one has a neck, and the other one doesn't. So. What Tofu allowed me to do is, after the fact, squash the body, add a neck Tofu joint, put a mane on that, and the animation's already there. Ship it. After spending about two weeks on the buffalo, this guy was about a day. And from this point forward in the project, I was able to do a giraffe in less than half a day. This was so exciting, like to think that maybe I should have gone India a while ago, and like <laughs> this could actually work. So, I don't know, for, for interest's sake, I'll show you the elephant. But yeah, just more of the same, really. Different combinations of these tofu blocks. And from the elephant, I built the hippopotamus, and I built the rhinoceros, and all of the other large, bulky animals. Um, so yeah, this is tofu. And <laughs> yeah, a total paradigm shift in how I thought about making characters. And now I have to quickly fast forward to the right part of the talk. Should be somewhere here. OK. Boom, 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 boom. Just quickly, is there any questions at this point? Or should I continue? Can you license Tofu out for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> funny thing. I'm about to talk about why you might hate me if I do. Uh, so we'll come what's, back to this. Um, so some of my secret sauce, I don't want to give away, but I can tell you that getting it into Engine was actually a lot of help from Dylan, because I was thinking this was not going to be feasible and it was probably going to break, like it was going to be too performance heavy and stuff. And there's a little bit of back and forth, which is why the buffalo took a while. But there is something called combined skinned meshes, which made it possible to keep basically one draw call, despite the fact that it's many, many meshes not combined until it gets into Unity. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but that was certainly a big breakthrough for making this possible. So at this point, the giant of indie is like, hey, who can do this? You're MacGyver or whatever. And this was the happiest part of the project where I got to be a dad and make stupid dad jokes and turn them into animals like the Bostrich or the Psychedelephant or the Dandelion or the Vulture on, which was made up of many tiny robot vultures. And Dylan and Tim had fun with this as well. And Paul, like everybody came up with cool ideas and it was so such a joyful task to wake up in the morning and have everybody go, you know what I think is a cool idea? An ostwitch. You should make a witch that's an ostrich. And yeah. Like, this is this is great. This is what I signed up for. This is why indie, because we're coming up with cool ideas. And at some point I slapped a giant cannon on the front of a flying zoo, which was not really planned either. And all of this is just moving along. And and it's kind of like that improv thing where like you're all very careful not to derail what's working, but it's all yes and. So there's very little no going on, and we're just trying to make sure that we don't rock the boat. But then the, like, the enormity of the task that I've got hasn't dawned on me because soon we're dealing with the publisher and they're setting a good date, which we should release by. And I've made lots of animals, but this is nothing. This is, like, this is, this is not, nowhere near enough to keep players coming back to the game time and time again over a long period. So at version 1.0 global release, after a brief soft launch, which told us some things but not others, um, I had to make seven times six animals per zone and we had two zones. And before that was even released, Tim, who's really good at modelling these things, had worked out like the rate of progression that people were going to have through the game on average. Like, you know, super invested players will get through faster. Uh, like, you know, super casual players will take a lot longer to get through. But the main average player is going to take one week to finish the first Africa, which is all the animals you see here. So that's a lot of content to give someone, but that's why our retention is so high, right? So trade-off. And then we're, they're going to need two weeks, because it's a little bit more grindy, to get through the jungle, which is the second area. So if you think about content updates on the App Store, if, if anyone who's done it before, right, you can't really get featured or like do good proper content releases two weeks apart. Like you can, but it's inhuman, especially for a team like us. Uh, even with Yodo's support, they were very helpful in this respect. So how the hell are we going to have enough content to keep people playing past three weeks if we're at launch? So this actually began the most stressful part of the project was we have a game, it's releasing soon, we think it's going to be successful, we don't know if it is, but either way we need to make another zone, which means another whole massive glut of animals, a whole new environment, a whole bunch more stuff in record time, faster than ever before. And it was, yeah, like, it was double this number of animals on launch. And th this became a problem for me, and I'm now going to explain some of the, you know, the fallout of doing it indie. So, yeah, now, if we fast forward to now, I don't have images of the other stuff, but I do, but a little bit later. So we've got seven animal types per zone. We've now got six to eight rare variants per animal. Actually, more. We've got seven for at least every animal in the game now. Uh, so that's like a total of four zones, and we've done a Halloween event. We've got, now got over 200 animals in the game. So hooray, the system works, but I need to hire someone else or I'm going to literally die. I ended up at the doctor's. I was like seriously unwell, and he's like, you need to take a bunch of vitamins. You need to stop working so hard. I'm like, but... I built this crazy 3D system and I can't teach anyone else how to use it because it makes no sense and <laughs> I can't leave the project. And, and so my idea of a holiday was flying to a different city and working out of a different office. <sighs> that, that was my holiday. And, yeah, hung out with the guys from Mr Shifty and, <laughs> yeah, they got to see me at my worst. So, yeah, this, this thing that I did, and, oh, yeah, we added hats. Because, because you've got to have hats and it was a way of like giving people more stuff to do without killing me. Um, so, yeah. Like, I'm now kind of going, yes, yeah, so I went indie. What am I thinking? Uh, because part of being indie is doing things your own way and part of doing things your own way is ignoring best practice, right? Throwing it to the wind. But then what happens when you need to get someone to help you? You need to bring on someone else. And they've probably trained at one of the colleges that I trained at. 
and they probably learned the standard workflow that I, I learned, and they're probably not as experienced as me, because otherwise they'd have a really good job and I wouldn't be able to get them. So I'm looking at taking on juniors to help me with this, which means I can't really train them to understand the tofu system. It's just too weird, and it wouldn't be fair to say, here, inherit this crazy system, I'm off to the beach, bye. Like, no, so you stay on board. And so with six-week intervals, we had to produce two more zones after, after launch. And it was grueling and crazy, but I did manage to get some help from a couple of juniors. And I still did the bulk of work myself, but they, they really helped out. And Yoda was, was doing a bit on, uh, on the side as well. So we did it, but it was insane. And if I had my time again, I would have planned better for this. And I probably would have made tofu less hacky, more sustainable. But things you learn. This was me and my wife and our baby for the next, I don't know, four months, falling asleep, dead tired on the couch. Because Kaya doesn't sleep that well. She's just a baby, so you can't blame her. Christine's not getting much sleep because of that, and she's also doing all the stuff around the house to make sure I can keep working. I'm working way too much. My short-term memory's shot. I'm, like, really sick and stuff. And it's like... So, yeah, the game releases and does really, really well, and we're happy, and it's a great problem to have. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. So Tofu, things that I learned about my time. It's a time saver, yes. It gives really great stylized animation, yes. And it, it's versatile while being consistent. So the look is great. And people keep telling us how much they love the animals, and that's really, really nice. But the bad things are that it's super complex and it can be error prone if you don't know what you're doing. It's animator focused. So finding a, a good rigger animator is hard. To, and then even then I'd have to explain to them why everything they've learned is null and void when they step into this, this job. And it's super idiosyncratic and esoteric, so it's hard to teach even though it's like it's already complex. <sighs> so did a thing and it's good, but it's bad. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, moving on to other aspects of the art, and I'll probably start asking questions. So we made lots of level bits. They're less imaginative, but they try and keep to the same art style. Um, and there's a fair bit of work to make these, but you know, once you've done the tofu system, this is pretty easy. Uh, and so this is how, like, oh, there's a lot of different chunks per zone, but they're pretty visually distinct. And this is how many zones we have now. And each of them has way more chunks than you first saw. And they're kind of strung together in a pretty cool procedural system that Tim developed. So if I was to, like, kind of run through some of the design principles behind the art, if, if you're interested, I'll kind of fill the rest of the time and then go for questions. So, uh, how best to describe the art style is really start with voxels and then cut corners and make diagonals and, and flowing lines where appropriate. And this seemed to work pretty well. And then the zoo was redesigned many times because it was done in a rush and was neglected in favour of most of the, the in-game stuff, but eventually came good and a lot of it was about kind of learning what is the aesthetic if it's not exactly voxels. And then why are there some areas that are pure voxel and why are there some areas that aren't? And it's really because sharp, jaggy things are dangerous and soft, yielding things are safe. And so we wanted to make the zoo less jaggy and the stampede more jaggy. Um, and, yeah, developing the zoo upgrades, this was something that Yodo suggested and turned out to be a really good idea, but it was a hell of a lot of work. And this was just one of the kind of design concepts for getting some consistency to it all. So th this, what you see here is not something that's in the game, but it was like the predecessor to it. So yeah, focusing on the in-game stuff. Why is it sometimes loopy and sometimes blocky? Well, jaggy things are dangerous, loopy things are less so. So for anyone who's played, if you hit the walls on the side of the savanna, they're pretty yielding. They're like you know playing bowling with a gutter ball bounce thing. So you bounce off them and they don't kill you as much. And this is because it's the first zone in the game and it's less difficult. And so it should be a little bit safer. Uh, the obstacles, however, are still super grid, grid aligned and pretty high contrast to the base. Now, at one point, we did try doing trees that are less blocky voxel. And we found that on a couple of levels, they didn't work because we want to reinforce the play area with perspective lines. Because when you're racing through the stampede, knowing at exactly what angle you're traveling and whether or not you're going to hit that obstacle that's like on this slight, like what, 15 degree angle because of the, the camera style that we've got. If you're not racing directly up the screen, it's a lot harder to judge those. So we tried to do everything to reinforce the grid of the level. 
And anything that broke it up was really not helping the player. Uh, how did we do small details with voxels? We didn't. So big chunky voxels suggest that something's really tough. So for anyone who's played, you can smash trees more easily on elephants than you can rocks until you upgrade the elephants. So there's like kind of degrees of smashability and, and, and dangerousness to obstacles in the game. And we tried to represent that with the size of voxels. Uh, but there's a point at which your granularity starts to break down. And so we tried to find other ways to represent similar things. Like you can't have African savanna without grass. You look at lots of photos of grass in the savanna and it looks kind of like this, but when you turn it into voxels, it looks shit. So you find another way to do it. Um, yeah, and then color space. So one of my favorite giants, Hugh, uh, previously from Half Brick and now from Pretty Great, he taught me some cool stuff about color space and how to make sure that the color space of your game, especially in your play field with regard to your UI, they all sit nicely in different parts of the luminance scale. And so we tried to make the central play field fairly uh, neutral. And then we tried to make the walls and the animals stand out from that. And there was some extra kind of shadow shaders that we used to blend the central play field into the walls and to ensure that anything that's really important, like the UI, or the hazards in the game, so any, anything that's really deadly, is given much, much higher contrast. So really bright brights and really dark darks. And this hopefully makes the right things pop and the other things sit neatly together. And certainly the rarer the animal, usually the higher the contrast of its colours because that will make it stand out in the stampede. And we also found a way to kind of get the UI and the stampede to interact through using shaders. So Dylan whipped up what he considers to be a fairly simple shader, but I was really impressed. It's a tune shader that also has a luminance value, like a, a, a colour emission value. So what this means is you can turn a regular buffalo into a UI element that really grabs your attention at the moment where it's about to get angry, it flashes red. At the moment where, you, where you're able to lasso it, it turns bright yellow. And so this turns like stuff that's in world into stuff that's like kind of UI sensitive and interacts with what the player's paying most attention to. Uh, how did we do the levels? Pretty simple, really. Voxel models, which I warped a bit, uh, baked ambient occlusion, and gradient shaders, like the tune shader. And then color tinting, which means that if you've played the game at all and you've made it past a thousand meters, you'll notice it's the same environment but with slightly different color tones so that you kind of feel like you've progressed from the easy part into the medium part. And if you get past 2000 meters, things get really intense in their color palette because it's like harder. And this was all done with uh, like batched meshes and, and color tinting. Um, this brings me kind of to the end of the talk, really. So uh, there's probably, um, more I could say if you wanted to know. Uh, we've just released the Halloween update. It changes the lighting. Uh, there's extra effects in there. We put jack-o'-lanterns and, and gravestones everywhere. We added Australian animals just before, before that. And we've got a lot more planned and there's a heap more work to do. I'm really burned out and I can't wait to take a holiday. <laughs> but, <laughs> but these are good problems to have, as I've been hearing a lot of people say. Really good problems to have is having a successful game and and trying to maintain it. Um, and just to finish up, like talking about how this never would have happened, I'm so grateful to my wife for making me, or giving myself permission really, telling me that I needed to do this, even if it wasn't safe. Um, and so this is what my days have been like. A boing, a boing, a boing, a boing, 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 boing. <laughs> That's your mommy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Did you want me to go into more detail about any of the, the technical stuff? Where did the idea for the airship do come from? All of the final was that design meeting. Uh, well, I guess I love Miyazaki a bit, so that was one thing. And I think the other thing was we were talking about having uh, you go to different locations, right? But you run a zoo, and the kind of the normal thing, I guess, like you know, it, it would be it would be remiss of us not to mention Disco Zoo in terms of like it's it's another zoo meta game. We really care more about the action game than about the meta game. Uh, but Disco Zoo had this notion of like you unlock vehicles which take you to new locations. 
And we kind of like the idea that you have a persistent thing, like a town builder almost, which the game is not really a town builder, but it has this persistent sense of value. Like you, you run a zoo and the zoo gets bigger and more impressive and gets cool new decorations every time you move to a new location and you discover new animals. So we could have made it a boat, but that's less cool. Like, and to be honest, there was even a discussion at one point about like live animal export and how cruel that is and how small the pens are and how many animals you can pack into them. And once you remove it from reality to the point where you've got flying zeppelins, mm. you know, you kind of just go with it. And then I don't know how the cannon happened, but I had a block of tofu and I made it squidgy and had the player fly out of it. <laughs> and it was a really explosive way to start the game, so we just kind of went with it. Plus it's nice to make clouds, especially if they <laughs> look like blocky clouds. <laughs> Uh, a couple of them are static meshes derived from tofu, but they don't bend or flex because performance. How early on did you guys settle on the art style? How? How early on did you settle on the art style? I don't think I th still don't think we've settled on the art style. <laughs> um, like, well, to to show you where the art back looks, like I don't know if I can zoom in at all, but like. The art style is evolving, and this is partially due to um, David Fernandez Huerta, who is a great art director, much, much better than me. Like, he's order of magnitude better. He works at Us Two Games. He, uh, he, he loved the game when he played it, and he wanted to stay in touch and give us advice. And he actually said, look, get on Skype. I want to download a bunch of goodness for you. And that was really nice of him. And he told me all the things he didn't like about the game, which was, you know, like humbling and felt kind of bad and I kept wanting to go, but I didn't have time. One of the things he said was like, you know, why are you sticking to voxels? Like the animals aren't pure voxel, why are you doing all the levels that way? I'm like, because it's quick to do. And he said, look, you could make good, cool, angular shapes that aren't voxels. So we did. And in the mountain zone, which was the first zone released after, uh, after V1.0, it's starting to distance itself away from voxels. And then if you look at the outback, we've got a lot more organic shapes. So... I mean, art style settled upon, don't think it is. Maybe we're just kind of polishing it as we go. Um, having, having more fresh eyes on the project, like hiring two of my ex-students who are like, they're still junior in terms of their career, but they're really, really good. Like so much better than I was at that age. Like uh, they've had some cool ideas as well and they've brought them to the table. So I kind of feel like it's a melting pot of styles. It's not tremendously consistent. Not maybe a good thing, because it keeps it fun and interesting to work on. Um. As far as your textures go, um, what's the standard texture size for the character? Or do you do you do each one depending on the amount of detail you want? So we make extensive use of Unity's kind of uh, like you know you up you, you you create a large texture and then you kind of crunch it to whatever you need the file size or the memory restriction to be. And that's been juggled around a bit. In terms of the, like, the thing that we started the project with was a giant 2048 by 2048 atlas and, like, buffaloes took up one sixteenth, like, you know, or was it 16? Yeah. I, sorry? Yeah, maybe I did. Um, that's very true. So hold on further down. So yeah, we had a, one giant atlas to rule them all. And then as we started doing more update content, we discovered that like we needed to start breaking up. So this atlas that you see here is not entirely full, but um, it contains all the animals from the jungle, all the animals from the savannah, and all the animals from the mountains in it. And then the outback is the start of atlas per zone because we ran out of space. Yeah, I was going to ask that. I'm assuming, yeah, because we're looking at the atlas going, we would very quickly run out of space as soon as you started to add more characters and that's what you wanted to do. So obviously, yeah, then you broke it up per region. Yes, which, which is a different set of problems. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get to batch things with the same draw calls, but it also means that, like, we have a bunch of other problems with the zoo. Like, if, you, if you're a hardcore player who's unlocked everything, your zoo is, like, chugging at the moment. So, like, unless you've got a really new phone, and this is one of the things that we're trying to tackle at the moment, like, be wary of getting a really successful game. And, <laughs> and like, you know, when people say we want more and you're like, I want to give it to you, I just don't want to break your phone. This is a problem. 
<laughs> so future proofing is a thing. Oh, I should have. <laughs> <laughs> so. We were we were maybe I don't know it was this time last year at GCAT when I met Ben. Okay, we've got five minutes so, or two minutes, maybe. I think I've run out of time. But uh, yeah, I met Ben Britton Smith and um, and Matt Ditton last year, and they told me about Shooty Skies, and they said that they don't learn a single texture for the whole thing. Or, or close to, and that that makes it load faster, makes it run faster, and you know everything. And I'm like, well, I probably should have done that. <laughs> but there are certain techniques uh, with with the style, like the, with the look of the game, it wouldn't be impossible with with vert colors. So, you know, if I had my time again, I'd probably experiment heavily with those rather than going straight for textures. So, yeah, haven't really made a haven't done art single handedly for a, a mobile game before. Thank you everyone for coming. I hope you got some more.